Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be sharing my time with the Member for York Southwest. And I'm very proud to rise in this House today and speak to this motion about the need for the House of Commons to finally get serious and to understand its obligation to address the long-standing deficit, moral, economic, social, historic deficit that has left so much of a part of our country in absolutely abominable conditions, and it must change. Canada, we've always told ourselves, is the greatest country in the world. And you know, the uh, International Index uh, for Human Indicators for Health and Social Well-Being, it always placed Canada right at the very top until they started to factor in the fact that there are two worlds in Canada. There's the non-native world, and then there's the fourth world that the Aboriginal communities are living in. And when they factored that in, Canada started to drop year by year by year. We're now down to eighth place. That is for, if you take it as a whole. But where are we in terms of the First Nation communities? Down at 63rd in terms of communities uh, uh, around the world. 63rd place. <clears throat> so what we're seeing right now from government is talk. We're seeing... Uh, they've got their message box, they've got press releases, and they expect that a young generation that's out there marching in the streets should be patient. I think what we've seen from the Idle No More campaign, which has been an unprecedented response across this country, it has been a virtual uprising of people who've come to feel that they're hostages in their own country, that they've been, they're somehow this colonized people on their own land and they're saying they're not putting up with it anymore and there is a sense of urgency here and this urgency needs to make us move beyond party lines because this problem didn't start with this present conservative government this is well over a century in the making and now it is time to pay up to pay up by saying we have to start fixing some of these fundamental problems that we have now 39% First Nation communities at high risk with water, that we have 34% at medium risk. That's 83% to the First Nation communities in this country where it's not safe to drink water. How can a country this rich say that that's okay? How is it possible that we're telling young people to be patient when they have substandard systems of education that is set up in a manner that is a form of systemic discrimination, that every child in this country walks into a school with an inalienable set of rights unless they live on a First Nation and then they get whatever the government gives them. And those kids are being told to be patient. They were told to be patient in Attawapiskat when the diesel fumes from a contaminant leak under the federal government's watch was coming up from the classrooms and the kids were passing out in the grade one classroom and coming home stinking of diesel, their daily exposures to benzenes and xylenes, cancer-causing agents, the families were told to be patient, that it would be fixed. Well, it was never fixed. It went on year after year. That's why people are marching in the streets, Mr. Speaker, because they're not going to be patient any longer. This generation has seen the time has come to pay up. And you know, it's never convenient to do the right thing. It's never an opportune time to do the right thing. You do the right thing because at a certain point in your juncture of your history, you are not the nation that you were meant to be unless you meet that fundamental debt, unless you pay that debt. And that is what we are called to do. We need to deal with the education deficit. And Mr. Speaker, I speak about this issue because I saw it through a child's eyes. It was probably the thing I learned most in this job was seeing what it was like through the eye of a child in Attawapiskat, Shannon Kustashin, who saw her life passing before her because she'd gone to school in crappy portables. She knew she had a substandard uh, education and she knew that if she did not get that one chance to get a better education, that it would be too late for her and too late for her generation. I saw that look in her eyes, I saw that look in the eyes of those children, and I realized that all the talk that goes on in this House isn't enough. We need to start seeing action. Now, Mr. Speaker, there's a number of steps that need to be taken in terms of economic development, in terms of meeting basic treaty commitments. And I like to talk about treaty, because there's this idea like, hey, we won, they lost, why don't they just shut up? You know, what's their problem? Well, that wasn't what the treaties were. 
When Treaty 9 was signed, and that represents the large region of the Anishinaabeaski territory where I represent, when Treaty 9 was signed, they went from community to community to community to ask the people to sign an agreement to share the land. And, they, you know, there are people who probably think, well, that was ancient times. Well, it wasn't, Mr. Speaker. I know people whose family signed the treaty. It's Grand Chief Stan Ludet's grandfather signed that treaty. Teresa Spence's grandfather signed the treaty. And when they came into uh, Fort Hope and they were saying, listen, guys, this is going to be a great agreement. What we're going to do is we're going to give you some money. We're going to give everybody eight bucks. And then you can go off and then we'll do our thing and you'll do your thing. And Chief Elijah Munias, and we have Chief Elijah Munias, uh, another version of Chief Elijah Munias alive today in Martin Falls, dealing with the Ring of Fire. And the Chief Elijah Munias at that time stood up and he said to the people, wait a minute, what's going on here? The white guys have come up and they've offered us eight bucks and they're telling us we're not having to give anything in return. And it's in the records, he warned the people about signing the treaty because they didn't know what they were signing on for. And it also says when they were signing on for Treaty 9 that one of the reasons that they felt they needed to sign was because they were worried about the future and they were willing to share the land and what they wanted in exchange was education. It was actually said that in the Treaty 9 documents that they saw their future for their kids was in education. And so the white commissioners signed that and you know what they gave them? They gave them the residential schools. They took their children away from them and tried to destroy them as a people. That's what they got in return for signing Treaty 9. Now, if you look at the history of Treaty 9 when they signed, before the community signed, they asked two clear questions. Because they were oral people. This wasn't written down. They asked to be clarified at the treaty signings. One of the questions was, what will happen to our hunting and fishing rights? Our ability to use our lands. And they said, it will not be impacted in any way. Well, they were lied to there. And the second question they asked, they said, will we be forced to live on these reserves that you're setting up? And the government said to them, no, you'll be free to live wherever you want. And that was also a, a promise that was broken because they were stuck on the reserves. And in Attawapiskat, for example, you can't even expand the community put in proper houses. All that land either belongs to the federal government or the province. And so they're stuck on these postage stamp sized reserves while right beside them, one of the largest diamond mines in the world, just down the road there will be gold mines. But in the treaty when they signed it, they said they were not going to be impacted in any way in terms of their ability to have their traditional use. Now this government might not recognize those treaties, but they've been recognized by the constitution of this country under section 35. They've been recognized in court decision after court decision after court decision. There's no ambivalence about this that the need to consult because they never gave up the right to use the land. So which brings us to Bill C-45 and this government's omnibus legislation where they decided they were going to strip the water protection, strip basic environmental protections in all the northern lakes and rivers. But they didn't have the guts to do it publicly. They weren't going to go out and tell the First Nation communities, guess what? It's open season on your waterways, on the Albany River, on the Moose River, on the Attawapiskat River. No, what they did was they stuck it into a budget bill and tried to ram it through without people noticing. And they figured they were going to get away with it. Well, now people are saying, wait a minute, you didn't consult. You didn't do your legal duty, which is that you have to consult. That is what the courts have shown, and that is what the, is in our Constitution. So, Mr. Speaker, the time has come to start addressing these issues. We are on a relationship together. It's been a very dysfunctional relationship, but it is the primary relationship in this country. It is the first relationship. And until we recognize that we are all treaty people, that we all share this land together, and that we are all going to be the country that we should be, when we make sure that our young First Nation children have the same opportunity as everyone else, until we do that, we will never be the country we're supposed to be. So this is a moment, all parliamentarians, let's start making it happen. Let's tell this generation they're not going to be betrayed by the way the last generation was and the generation before them. Thank you very much. Questions and comments, Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Speaker. 
2009 KPMG report shows that First Nations with direct control over the reserve lands and the resources under the framework agreement and the First Nations Land Management Act are making decisions at the speed of business and that economic development is much greater than in comparison to those lands which are administered by the government under the Indian Act. And many of those surveyed reported a shift in the quality of jobs available on reserve and that these had higher education requirements. And this has significantly reduced the dependence on social programs and pumped hundreds of millions of dollars into local economies. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is why does the member opposite not want our First Nations peoples to succeed? The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Speaker, my poor colleague. <laughs> I'd invite her to come up. Come up and see some of the communities. When we're talking about children who don't have schools, does she have any communities where kids are denied the right to schools? Do any of the kids in her communities, do any of them get ex educated on grounds full of benzene and toxic contamination? No. So if we're talking about all our children getting the fair chance in life, exactly. then you've got to start putting the money where the mouth is. Yeah. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Longueuil, Pierre Boucher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'd like to thank my colleague for his speech because I've rarely heard such a connection between knowledge of a file and practical expertise. He knows the people and you really get a sense of it from his speech. You get a sense that he truly wants to build peace to restore our relationship with First Nations. And basically what I'd like to ask, the question that was just asked of him was uh, so incredible, but I'd like to ask my colleague, doesn't he think that current governments want to deal with, they seem to want to deal with Aboriginal issues uh, and given all everything that's happening with Idle No More, doesn't he get the impression that the government just wants to act as if it's business as usual? I, I want to thank my honourable colleague. It, it is not business as usual anymore. The time has come to recognize the legitimate issues that are out there that are going to have to be dealt with on the nation-to-nation -nation basis where it has to be dealt with with respect. It can't pick and choose. They can't just pick the one thing that they want to bring forward and they're going to ignore the rest. It is about restoring the relationship because what I've seen in my communities is the enormous potential for change, the enormous potential and the enormous amount of goodwill that exists within the First Nation communities. But the time for respect is here where this government and the next government have to say there will be the commitments to fix the shortfalls so the communities can get up to speed and then the communities need to take that freedom and move forward to build the kind of economies that we need in the 21st century. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Mount Royal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, earlier today the Member for Toronto Centre referenced uh, the uh, Liberal government under which I served under Prime Minister Paul Martin in a non-partisan way, but I just wish to recall one particular part that I think uh, bears not only uh, recall today, but in fact acting upon uh, that commitment, which we have failed uh, signally to do, and it is both a government commitment and a parliamentary commitment. And the first day that government of which I was a part met, our first cabinet meeting, Prime Minister at the time said that at the end of the day, our government will be judged by one issue, what he called the legacy issue, and that will be how we have fulfilled our commitments to the Aboriginal peoples. Question is, has the government put in place a similar whole of government approach which would not only affect what was intended by the Kelowna Accord, but what we have somehow forgotten was a parliamentary enactment. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With all due respect to my honoured colleague, I worked with the Algonquin Nation in Quebec under the Liberal government, and I can tell you that what I'm hearing now sounds more like fiction than the historical <laughs> record. So if on the very first day their cabinet met, 
They said that they would be judged by their legacy to First Nations, and then they waited till a week before the election to suddenly come up with their deathbed conversion. In the intervening 13 years, that was a big, long, long, dry period. So I would say to my honourable colleague, they had the opportunity. They failed. And in fact, let's not just blame the Martin government. This goes back to 20th century. Who was there year after year after year when these situations got worse and worse and worse? It was a Liberal government. So, hey, I love deathbed confessions. I know they're sincere, but let's not pretend that there's anything other than that. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for your...